Uh, Manu, I can't see. Okay, let me mute you. I can't see the screen at all. I see something that says join audio, share screen, and invite others, and I've never seen the screen before. I just muted you. But can you see a regular Zoom screen? Sure. Unmute you. I don't see you at all. There you okay. Now I see your name. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, your patience and thank you for joining us today. This will be a really interesting discussion on public defenders and public safety here in San Francisco during COVID-19. My name is Carolyn Knowles and I'm the Interim Director of Development and Alumni Relations here at University of San Francisco School of Law. Um, this record is being recorded, so we will send you um, this recording afterwards and um, everyone except for the speakers, um, you are all muted at this point because of the number of um, people who have joined us today, but we would love for you to participate um, via the Q&A feature so that um, we can get your questions answered as well and we'll um, answer as many of those um, as possible. With that, I would like to introduce our um, participants today, our speakers. Um, first of all, um, Dean Strang. He is a professor here at the University of San Francisco School of Law. He has practiced criminal defense for more than three decades. He's won Wisconsin's first federal defender. He was Wisconsin's first federal defender and has argued in the United States Supreme Court, five federal circuits, and the Wisconsin Supreme Court. The broader public came to know him through Making a Murderer and through his two books of legal history. Dean has spoken at dozens of universities, colleges, and theaters across the United States and the world on criminal justice. He has also served as an adjunct professor at the University of Virginia Law School, the University of Wisconsin Law School, and Marquette University Law School. Manu Raju is the San Francisco public and a founding member of Public Defenders for Racial Justice. He completed his undergraduate degree at Columbia University and holds a master's degree in South Asian Studies from UC Berkeley, where he also earned his law degree. He worked as a deputy public defender in Contra Costa County for seven years before he was recruited by Jeff Adachi to join the San Francisco Public Defenders Felony Unit in 2008. Due to his impressive practice as a felony line attorney, he was promoted to be the director of training and then manager of the felony unit. The personal interest he takes in his clients' lives helps fuel him not only to fiercely litigate and win cases, but also to raise his voice against the inequities he and his clients encounter in the criminal justice system. It has earned him the loyalty of his entire department and the confidence of Mayor London Breed, who appointed him to fill the post in March 2019. Welcome to both um, Professor Dean Strang and Public Defender Mano Raju. Thank you for having us. You're welcome. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'll add that too and remind you that questions are welcome from our audience simply using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. You know, let's get started, um, if we can. <laughs> if we can. Um, for, for those who either uh, aren't lawyers yet or never intend to be a lawyer, um, tell us a little bit about what a criminal defense lawyer is and does and specifically what criminal defense lawyers do at the San Francisco 
Public Defender's Office. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit too about the office's history, uh, scope of its workload, but can you take those in any order you want them? Sure, sure, thank you for the question. You know, for our Public Defender's Office, we've been around since 1921. So we're actually coming up on the 100 year anniversary this year. Uh, there's about 200 employees in our office. We represent about 20,000 people a year in some fashion or another. Uh, we have, we represent people on misdemeanor cases. We represent them on felony cases. We also have a very vibrant immigration unit and we have a um, clean slate program where we help people to clean their records that they do. If they did sustain a conviction for some reason, we have a uh, very strong juvenile unit where we represent people who are uh, or youth, and we also have a strong uh, specialty court unit where we represent people in, for example, veterans court, drug court, uh, community justice court. Uh, there's a lead program where we divert people from the system, um, veterans court, if I didn't mention that. So there's a number of things that happen in the public defender's office. We also have, and when we say defenders, we have social workers, clerical staff, paralegals, investigators, and attorneys. And all of us form a vital part of what the public defender's office does. We also have a policy unit that works on statewide legislation and local initiatives. So we're pretty expansive in our vision of what we do. Um, as far as um, any individual in our office, I would say that public defenders ideally were functioning on a triangle. We're warriors on the one hand, which means leaving no, no stone unturned to defend our clients as well as we possibly can. That means investigating every angle of the case, both at the scene, what happened before, what could have happened um, during, um, what are all the angles that people are looking at things from, uh, filing every single motion we could, and very importantly, really preparing ourselves to be uh, hopefully top flight trial attorneys so we can bring as much truth into the courtroom as possible. We're also counselors. So any member of our staff can be in a situation with someone who's accused of something or detained for some reason. And on some level, we are the counselors for people to, to hopefully facilitate them making the best decisions, both in their individual case and also facilitating perhaps um, rehabilitation if necessary or empowerment to move in a more positive direction after our representation has ended. And also importantly, we're activists because I think more and more, there's become more and more awareness of the injustices of the system, mass incarceration, the racial injustices, um, economic inequities, um, the lack of, uh, adequate representation in many cases. And so part of what we're trying to do, both on an individual and a broader scale, is to, to change the system. And I think an ideal public defender in many ways is pivoting around that triangle at all times. You may, in the course of one case, be a warrior, a counselor, and an activist at the same time. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back, I think, to each of those three sides of the triangle sure. described for public defenders specifically and criminal lawyers generally, but uh, since you're sitting there uh, in front of a fake background of the Golden Gate Bridge, right. probably all 200 people in your office are working remotely as the courts are. Uh, talk to me, talk to all of us a little bit about those who aren't um, remote from one another, those who are presumptively innocent and sitting in one of the San Francisco uh, jails. Um, and, and let's include in that uh, correction staff or sheriff's department staff in those uh, jails. What's life like right now for your clients and, and others who are presumptively innocent and awaiting trial now longer than they expected or maybe serving a short sentence in jail. What does that look like for those who are living with each other in that way? Sure, it's, you know, it's challenging. Um, you know, people are, like many of us, are, are, are scared. They're scared of potentially contracting the virus. And um, 
it's difficult obviously to to try to if, if possible actually to socially distance in a way that people who are not incarcerated can it's also difficult to boost your immune system in the way that you may want to whatever way you think whether it's extra vitamins turmeric whatever whatever it is you feel you need to do um to boost your immune system that's also uh impossible to do exercise well, so exercise exercise get some fresh air that's 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 something that people can't do and that's why what we try to do is um file motions for people with some amount of time left in their in serving their sentence where they're going to be released in any event to a probation department to try to have those folks released earlier um, in as many cases as possible. And we've also been uh, trying to push as public defenders, the judicial council to and local jurisdictions to change the bail schedule so that people can be safely released uh, back to the community while their cases are pending. So we're trying to do as much of that as possible. We're also doing that on a broader scale um, with the Department of Corrections. Um, so whenever people can be safely released, we're encouraging all, all players in the system, from police officers to the sheriff's department to the district attorney, to really think about, um, you know, the biggest piece of public safety at this point is actually public health. And I think we really need to view incarcerated people as part of the broader community when we make decisions about um, whether or not someone needs to be incarcerated. And just if you know, you know, just to give us some background, roughly what is the census today at the various jails that hold your clients as opposed to say six months ago? Does, uh, does the census in the jails today? Do you have a meaning the numbers of people or the numbers? Uh, yeah. 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 So in San Francisco, we've been able to reduce the population. It was over uh, a thousand. And in the last few months, we've gotten it down into the 700. So that's a pretty substantial uh, reduction. And there are, I, so I'm not sure exactly what it is in many places, but one thing to keep in mind when we hear about numbers is that, you know, th there's not uh, readily available testing for everyone. So when we hear about numbers, we have to be aware there may be many more people who actually have the virus, but just haven't been tested. And that's why we're working, you know, desperately to try to, as many people that can be released safely, we're trying to have that accomplished. I think one of the things that the current uh, pandemic and public health crisis um, exposes very clearly for those who haven't seen it in all its aspects is the, um, the racial inequities in society and the class, um, the effects of class, simply um, how uh, moneyed or impoverished you, you are. We're seeing that in sharper relief in a number of ways um, currently. So back to the, you know, let's sort of start with the microscopic on the, the counselor side of your triangle and the warrior side of your triangle what what are you folks doing right now um for individual clients mm -hmm. you know, maybe hundreds of them but at an individual level what are you doing to try to mitigate their risk if you can't get them out if they're not one you know in that 30 percent who have been released in uh in the current pandemic yes well one thing we've tried to insist on is just making sure that each one of our clients in custody has the has the PPE, you know, that the masks uh, necessary and hopefully that they're being uh, swapped out as often as possible. So we're sort of really strongly advocating for to make sure that everyone in custody has the right protective equipment, particularly masks. The other, uh, just last week, uh, I helped a community activist and actor, Jamal Trulove, who some people on the call may know, to drop off uh, 800 masks uh, to the sheriff's department, which they accepted. So that's one piece of it. The second piece is, you know, I think one thing we find during times of crisis is that there's more possible than there was before. So previously there's th four jails in San Francisco currently operating, and we were able to set up uh, conferences with one of the jails before it was video conferences and then audio conferences. Now we've 
work with the sheriff's department so that we can have uh, video conferences that we set up the time for uh, in all of the jails. So that's one thing just to make sure that people uh, are hearing from uh, their, their attorneys frequently. There's almost, it's, I've never heard a client complain that they've seen their attorney too often or they've seen a public defender too often. So, you know, we're really trying to make sure that we fill up that, that sheet and that our clients are getting visits, even although be remotely as much as possible. The next step is to get visits from family and those are starting to be arranged through through Zoom and we're gonna keep on pushing for that because I think that's so vital. Um, we often forget that people charged with a crime are, are members of our family and community. They have kids, they have aunts, they have uncles, they have uh, parents. And to really view someone as each individual as part of the community is central to the kind of representation that we give and to let them know we're gonna to continue to fight for them. Um, we, what we don't want is people pleading to things that they shouldn't be pleading to just because they're desperate to get it over with. And it's a real balance. We're trying to work with the courts to try to do hearings. Um, so when they've now started doing preliminary hearings and eventually to start doing trials. I wanna go back and pick up on a comment you made yeah. uh, there in responding to me. Uh, the gist of which is that, you know, crisis presents opportunity as well. And, mm -hmm. The current crisis has presented opportunities, for example, for those who would increase overall surveillance of the population because it, it looks attractive to be doing that with yeah. contact tracing and whatnot. Right. But it, it, it also presents potentially some opportunities for that third side, the activist side of your, your triangle, doesn't mm -hmm. it? And I'm, I'm wondering what you see here as a possibility for permanent improvement in your work and in the lives of your clients going forward? Yeah, you know, one thing that we like to uh, emphasize in our office is that for whatever reason people came through our doors, we'd like to see them better off when they leave. You know, whether that's connecting someone up with a tech internship, whether it's a hiring hall, further uh, community college classes, uh, or, um, uh, re rehabilitation services if necessary, whatever that may be. So I think, and, and crucial to that is, is housing. So we um, developed opportunities for, um, excuse me, we developed opportunities for our clients, our housing availability for our clients. That, that are homeless and there's been hotel rooms made available and working with the probation department we've, we've made some other housing opportunities available now that weren't available before and you know we've always known we've had a homeless crisis in in san francisco and now um we are seeing that you know that there are solutions to that so that's one area An another area is as i said before the visits but I think crucial, we, we, I think we need to start thinking of public defender's offices as public safety offices. Because we get in touch with clients at an early point in our, um, in representation. And when they're incarcerated, hold on for one second, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. I'm gonna to have to move. Um, uh, got a homeschool going at the same time. So apologize for that. You and millions of people. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. New location. So, and I think to to view us as a, a, a public safety organization, that at the very beginning, when we start representing someone, not only do we want to legally generate the best outcome for them, but we want to personally develop the best outcome for them. So um, we meet people even before arraignment and it's never too early to start working on a re-entry plan. Um, sometimes when people look at, oh, the, uh, the recidivism rate is X or Y, we should look at the Y. And the answer isn't just incarcerate people more. The answer is, well, let's invest more in real robust social services, housing, public health, so that people, when they do manage to 
you know, finish their legal case are actually moving in a more positive direction. I think seeing a redirection of resources in that direction of real robust uh, reentry services is a change that we should really be uh, pushing forward this time. And do, do you get a sense, you know, that any of the um, other institutional actors in the, you know, criminal framework, the punishment framework, are, are beginning to think of the public defender's office as a public safety organization, at least in part, or is this, is this an idea that hasn't become salient outside your office yet? I don't think it's become quite as, as salient as it should be yet. Um, I mean, being an elected public defender and having an opportunity to, you know, to, to be out there more, I try to, um, I try to push that idea and let people know why that makes so much sense. Because keep in mind, we have that attorney client relationship. We have that, those confidential communications. We can find out things about an individual that, no one else can. On top of that, our clients, if we're doing our job properly, are seeing ourselves fighting for the best possible results. So they're much more likely to have trust in us than, say, you know, uh, a pr probation officer or someone else because they see us from the very beginning fighting for the best outcome. So I'm really interested in, in making sure that we continue to define ourselves that way. And, it, and just on a more basic level, you know, the mere fact of someone standing next to you and fighting for you in court, it's say in a jury trial where, you know, for eight, for six, seven hours a day, you're doing a vigorous cross-examination, you're giving a compelling opening statement, you're really fighting for someone. A lot of clients have felt unseen or not, um, not really noticed or, or it's in many, in, both in educational environment, uh, in, in other environments and to really feel seen and have someone fighting for you. I've seen cases of other uh, clients of other people or those myself. Just the mere fact that you really fought for them is a springboard to push someone in a more positive direction. And that is part and parcel of what public safety needs, right? Um, we're trying to not just have people stay out of the trouble, but actually aspire to something more. And I think that's something that we're uniquely positioned to do. On the system side, I think that the current crisis has forced all of the institutional actors into um, accepting technology uh, in a way that maybe they hadn't before and now of necessity must, um, you know, like conducting this kind of an interview by Zoom, which wouldn't right. be my first choice, but, but mm -hmm. we learn to accept it and we have 60 plus people joining us. Right. Um, now, the, some of the use of remote um, video conferencing and technology presents real Sixth Amendment and due process concerns. Um, but some of it, to the extent that sheriff's departments or corrections departments are getting comfortable with the idea of Zoom conferences, potentially could be very helpful to, say, families. Mm -hmm. of clients um, over time if, if, if they could avoid trooping down to a jail and going through the process of getting in even for just a video interview mm -hmm. by doing a, a, a meeting with a loved one in the jail by Zoom or FaceTime or Skype or whatever. Um, there's potentially some improvement in the lives of the people you represent and, and those they love. Um, do, you, do you see a potential here for a lasting shift in the kinds of connectivity options that corrections people and courts may be open to? That's a great question. Um, and I think the important word to um, keep in mind when we contemplate this question is and, as opposed to or. You know, I think it's vital um, as I said before, the more contact, the better from both uh, defender staff and families. And it would be devastating if our ability to have in-person visits was diminished in any way. It is super important for our clients to see their family members and to see their defenders. Having said that, um, you know, I'm sure I 
client would love to see an in-person visit and then another video conference. And I think we have, we have that capability now. So I think it's, and, and, that, and the same goes for proceedings happening in court, um, you know, trying to cross-examine someone via Zoom, Zooming into a courtroom is very challenging. And those who've, who've started doing that in my office are having, are, are finding those challenges. So, um, you know, it's really important that that right to confrontation is preserved and we're able to cross-examine in court. But to the earlier point, I think, yes, we should figure out now that we have the technology, we, it's important that we don't go backwards and we continue to figure out ways to, to, to generate that connectivity, but it can't be at the expense of the in-person visit because that's just so, it's just so vital. Let me follow where you led here on um, the, the courtroom aspect of you know, the environment within which you work. I'm just wondering, back to the microscopic, what, what judges are doing with uh, hearings by Zoom. You, you mentioned lawyers in your office trying to cross-examine by Zoom. I'm assuming you mean in preliminary hearings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not at not at trials, right? Um, but but tell me what sort of hearings are happening remotely right now, and how in general you think that's worked. I'm curious, for example, specifically about any particular problems uh, with that sort of remote link up that you didn't anticipate and that people might um, not expect. Well, I, I, I wouldn't say we didn't anticipate them because I think we did anticipate there's going to be all sorts of issues with this. Uh, I was just talking with a colleague who, you know, did a preliminary hearing where one of the witnesses zoomed in and the other was in person, and this was just night and day. Um, the district attorney wasn't in the room, so it was it was the attorney, uh, our our client that we were representing, who was distance in some ways although then he had to take his mask off for the purpose of the identification. So it's, um, it, it's, it's a new world and there's problems that I'm hoping that eventually we are working this out, but we appreciate at least being able to do hearings because the reality of the system is unless we have attorneys in court doing hearings and pushing the cases forward, we never get to a resolution that makes sense. There's always, once you do a live, once you start doing hearings, there's always something different about the case than it appeared initially, than how it appeared initially on paper. And and the, I would say the same thing goes for trials. It, um, until we, Unless we have the pressure of a last day for a trial, no one's really seriously looking at the case in the way that they need to in its full uh, shape. So um, both for doing trials and potential dispositions, we need those contested hearings to be something that's looming with with actual deadlines too. And what just specifically what kinds of hearings are happening right um, now in San Francisco? That varied by judge. Yeah, right now currently in San Francisco what's happening is they're doing focusing on preliminary hearings. So in a felony case before someone can be uh, kept in custody there has to be a hearing to show a judge a strong suspicion that the elements of the crime have been met. So those are the hearings right now that are happening. We're encouraging the court to also do something called a 995 hearing, which is a review of the preliminary hearing, because that's something that can be done in a non-evidentiary way. You're looking at the papers and your and the previous transcript and saying that, you know, that the elements, the earlier judge made a mistake. And that those non-evidentiary hearings, we're encouraging the courts to start doing those. They haven't happened yet, but we're hopeful that in the next week or so we're going to start that. Have you noticed here in the, you know, in the last several weeks, any trends in substantive outcomes? Um, or has the technology sort of melted away and outcomes, both with the judges and with the district attorney's office, look a lot like what they were substantively before the lockdown? We, you know, I haven't really done a, a, a deep dive to really actually look at the numbers, but I mean, one outcome is that some of the people that have already been sentenced, there, there's a little less time on that end. On the other end, to be honest, there's a lot of, um, there's a little bit of a holding pattern because we're not able to do the hearings in the way that we want to right now. So um, I think some, 
we're, our hope is that there's a more thought process going into the actual filings that are happening. Um, and that, you know, there's been a change in the bail schedule statewide and that hopefully there's deferral, deferrals in some prosecutions that don't need to happen. Um, but um, certainly that's something we're always trying to vigorously guard against because we don't want people pleading just to, just because of the, to things they shouldn't because of the health crisis. I know we've got about four minutes before we're gonna sure. start taking audience questions which are coming in. Um, sure. I, and I wanna make sure we've got uh, 20, 25 minutes for those. But um, let me try to come back and um, put a number of questions to you in a framework. And you can, you can respond as you wish to this. Sure. But um, one, one thing that I, I think does bear mention is that a former colleague of yours in the San Francisco Public Defender's Office now uh, is the elected district attorney in San Francisco, Chase Boudin, and uh, ran uh, on this uh, platform, I, I guess I'll call it, that 10 years ago nobody had heard of, the idea of a progressive DA. Um, and I, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, when you have a progressive DA, someone who means that, means what she says or he says, and, and intends to be an agent of change on the prosecution and policing side, what role the public defender as an institution has in that sort of uh, transformative potential, for one. And for two, we're also talking to an, an audience here that's heavily composed, not entirely, but heavily composed of law students, uh, younger lawyers, um, and, and people interested in law. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'd like to have you talk about not just the transformative opportunities with a progressive district attorney, uh, but also something formative for you during your law school experience. What led you to the conception of the triangle uh, mm -hmm. that you described for the public defender in specific and the criminal defense lawyer more generally? Uh, what would you recommend, based on that formative experience, that people who are in law school themselves now or in their early years of practice and may be interested in politics or interested in social change, what do you, what do you, what do you offer them right now as, you know, there's sort of a moment to pause and think about some of these questions over the last several weeks? Yeah, I, I think this... Um you know, this, this current public health crisis is offering, offering a lot of us a moment to pause and reflect um, about how, how things can be. So I would say first, I'll take the first piece of your question with a progressive prosecutor, Chase Boudin, now being in office. In many ways, our job doesn't change. And he understands fully that it's vital that we continue every single day to fight for our clients. And that's only logical for at least two reasons, if not more. One is that the window into who our clients are is something that only we have that view of, right? We can do a deeper, have a deeper understanding of our clients and of their social histories to give a better, fuller picture of who they are. And secondly, in terms of what happened, the prosecutor is limited by a police report, which is, you know, written at a particular point in time by particular people with often a particular bias. But the fuller picture of what may have happened in any particular incident is something that only we can bring to the table by listening to that through cross-examination, by doing full investigation, to actually have a fuller picture of something that happened. Um, and oftentimes that's only going to happen in a jury trial. Um, it's something that the prosecutor won't have a window to in most um, saliently uh, what the client's perception is because that's a testimony that is only going to happen at trial if they invoke their mind if they didn't speak to the officers before we're going to find out only at trial what the reasons are that something may have happened um, so that's one piece that it's vital that in any decision that's made by a prosecutor can only happen after we've done all the legwork to justify that decision um, 
as far as all the different possibilities, whether it be a counselor or a warrior or an activist or something, um, an area of our field that people may want to jump into. And now for another, just to throw out another uh, phrase, what I like to think of what we do is like we fight, we heal and we build. And we're trying to do all of those simultaneously. You know, I think it's really important to actually just get in there and feel what's right for you. You know, I mean, I think there's a lot of pieces of this puzzle. Um, you know, housing advocates are very vital to the work we're doing as public defenders, uh, people working in the employment realm, uh, counselors. There's a lot of th types of work that are pieces of this puzzle. And I think it, what's an important thing to do is to go and do an internship somewhere. You know, I have a particular memory when I was in law school of interning for Mac Gonzalez, who subsequently became the chief attorney in my office and is still the chief attorney. And he's a, just a masterful trial attorney. So I remember him watching him in trial while he was doing that work. But then I remember you know, coming across a client who wasn't his trial client and that client had some questions about his case. And you could just see Matt and how fully, he, how present he was in that moment. It was only five minutes but he was just so present for that client who wasn't his trial client in that moment. And you really sensed that. And you could tell that that client knew that Matt had his back and was going to do everything he could to get the best result for him. So seeing, just remembering the sort of solemnity of that counselor relationship and how he was in that moment um, was special. And I would say another thing is I was fortunate while I was in law school to take a criminal trial practice class. My client was charged. Uh, with an attempted murder, with self-defense, and just going through the full trial, giving the closing argument, my trial client was acquitted, and feeling what it's like to do an actual trial. And to me, uh, being a public defender job is literally the best legal job I can imagine doing. Um, it's to the exhilaration of being able to really throw your full intellectual, emotional, and spiritual being into a trial to try to, to um, get a just outcome for a client is something there, there's no feeling uh, that matches that in my, in my, in my mind. Um, so, but I think you have to really want to do that and you have to be willing, especially when you get to the more serious cases, you have to realize there's a lot on your shoulders. And if you're not willing to take that risk, then, you know, this comp that component of public defender trial heavy work may not be for you, but there's so many other ways to make contributions. Um, and there's a lot of reform happening both statewide and on a national level. And we should really be thinking about what, what that can look like. Terrific, thank you. Um, thank you. I wanna move to questions from others in the sure. audience. I'm not gonna give you any softballs. Okay. Um, uh, the first question that came in is from Steph and it's a good one. Um, it's a little long, but let me, let me read it to you. Sure. Uh, given the overriding concern for public health and safety in the community, how do you balance the impetus to release individuals, understandable, um, as a public defender, release people from custody who suffer from mental health problems and may be suffering even more now, uh, or substance abuse problems, let's include that in the, in the field of mental health, issues. How do you balance that with individual safety, them and the safety of the community and others in it? And she wants, she's hoping you'll comment on the need for collaboration among uh, defenders, courts, prosecutors, and law enforcement to facilitate the safe and successful release of people who've been incarcerated back into the community. That's a great question. And let me also add, there's so many community organizations that we should be really uh, developing links with and making sure that, that any transition is a safe one. I mean, the last thing that we want as defenders is someone to be released and then, you know, commit a crime and potentially harm someone and come back in. That's the last thing in the world we want. And that's why it's so vital that we actually work on um, constructive Reentry plans that we have beds for people that we have uh, mental health uh, beds if necessary or or uh, housing for people and that we have that type of uh, service and we have people checking in with folks I, I fortunately had two clients who were released uh, had good outcomes on their cases right before this and every week I'm checking in with them to make sure 
they're doing well. And that's a big piece of what we should be doing. But keep in mind, a lot of the folks that we're talking about, they're going to be uh, released soon in any event. And what's important to us is, wouldn't you rather have someone released who didn't contract the virus versus someone who did, and they can possibly infect other people? So release is only one part of the solution. What we really need is really uh, culturally competent people who can meet people where they're at and make sure they're moving in a direction where they hope that public safety can still be managed at the same time. Uh, Martha has a very specific question that I, I think can be answered briefly, but it, it's interesting and others may mm -hmm. think it interesting too. Given that so much of what's happening right now in court has moved online with the pretrial process of the case, uh, how does that change the record on appeal? What is the record on appeal? Is it a Zoom recording or are court reporters present? How is that working? Well, it's, it's something that we're going to have to see because we haven't done a trial yet in San Francisco. My understanding is they're subpoenaing, subpoenaing uh, or ca calling rather to court a lot of uh, jurors for a trial that's going to happen beginning on June 1st in Contra Costa, but we haven't had that yet. Um, you know, there's still, we're going to obviously insist on very thorough records being made, court reporters typing everything, and that's that's the part of defenders to make sure that nothing is slipped up. And some hearings are going to be, frankly, a lot longer. If you're, if if a witness is zooming in, then you're going to have to ask about 15 more questions than you would have otherwise. Like, who else is in the room? Are there any materials in front of you? Because these are things that we can't see. Um, so we're going to be having to perfect our ability to make as thorough a record as possible. And then try to figure out how to get access to documents the witness has and is used to refresh a recollection, but right. that you don't have and are, you know, 15 miles away where the witness is. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But you're still seeing court reporters play the role they've always played. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. So and we're going to continue to insist on that. Carol from Sonoma County has, uh, has a good question. And she says, look, it sounds as though your office has far more resources than the public defender in Sonoma County. Are there ways we non-legal people can contribute support for our local public defenders? How can we learn about and support measures or bills that public defenders, whether in San Francisco or statewide, support? Well, one is we, you know, you can reach out to our office and we'll figure out a way to, to hook you in because I really think we're, we're at the precipice and the beginning of a movement. And so the more people who want to be involved, the better. One thing you can more immediately do in your county is really support your public defender's office to get more resources because it is a holistic movement. And there are so many fronts to work on. Like, we need to spend more time with our clients. We need to do more thorough investigations. Even though our county is better resources than others, there's no defender who doesn't wish they had more hours in the day because there's still more that can be done. And there's still always gonna be one client sitting in custody for longer than they should have because that attorney's doing a trial uh, for another one of their clients as opposed to having another attorney ready to do that case. So um, there are, so many ways to get involved and if you reach out to our office we can connect you up with um there are different organizations who are working against mass incarceration and public defender's office so we'd be happy to connect you up you mentioned at the outset that your office has a public policy section mm -hmm. specifically how would carol or others get in touch with that public policy section if they send an email to uh julie we will we'll reach out to you Okay. Okay. Yeah. Terrific. To, to uh, the USF connection. Um, you've got a you've got a friend, uh, Lauren. I'll leave it at that. Um, and she's she's wondering more about the reentry planning that you've discussed a little bit. And are there resources and and programming available right now with COVID nineteen? Some programs are no longer accepting new clients. Is that is that true in the Bay Area too? Um, yeah, there are some alternate work here. Yeah, there are some programs that aren't accepting people. Um, and just to, I'm going to give you one example. There's a Sunset Youth Services, which is a 
wonderful program in the Sunset in San Francisco that really tries to facilitate people both seeking employment and they're also uh, have a strong musical component where young people can come into the studio and express themselves art artistically and and record. Um, and one thing they that I've been talking to the director of that program, he's been sending people on their phone little beats that they can work on and they can send it back. So this is a time where we have to be creative and he's even gone and in a socially distanced way met met with this young person. So they're talking and still engaging and I'm I'm calling him up and I'm having other community organizations check in because a lot of it is just making sure you uh, maintain that connection with people. So, and I think that can not be done in the same way, but it can be done in some way. And I think it's just a matter of, you know, we're, we're weaving this cloth week by week just to make sure we can do whatever we can until we can do something even more in depth. Good. All right. I'm going to try a mashup now of a question okay. from Wayne and another one from Karina. Yeah. Um, for logistical reasons, um, do you and your client lose too much of what an in-person, say, preliminary hearing can and should be when you have a Zoom preliminary hearing? Uh, and for example, how do you talk to your client confidentially while you're in the midst of examining a witness or confer, you know, along the way with a client? How do you simultaneously watch everything that's happening, the DA, the judge, Mm -hmm. uh, witness reactions, that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Is it a good trade-off? And then where Karina picks up from that is what sort of requests or demands is your office making in order to make sure that trials, when we resume them in person, really are safe for everybody mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, and, as, and as efficient and fair as, as they can be? Excellent, excellent question. And might say you're a master facilitator to be able to mash these questions together and, and, and re-articulate them. I can see why you're so effective in court. Um, you know, it, it's 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 going to be a a individual decision that you know the counselor defender team is going to make with each client. Are hearings as ideal as they should be now? Absolutely not. I mean, we're debasing methods where we can either use headphones or walkie-talkies to communicate with clients. There's going to have to be breaks during that time so that that conversation can can happen. Um, but the hearing isn't as robust by definition or probably not as robust as it would be under better circumstances. Having said that, you know, there are going to be situations where you don't want your clients sitting in custody for another 30, 40 days or even longer. Uh, because you didn't get through the preliminary hearing. Because once you get through the preliminary hearing, then you have an arraignment date on what's called an information in California, and then you can set a trial. And once that happens, we can keep on pushing. Whereas if we delay that, um, then um, that's, it's going to delay the back end of the trial. And that's why it's important that we do that. As far as trials, I know we're communicating with the court about how vital it is it is for us and our clients to have jury trials and to preserve that constitutional right in a meaningful way. I think what's going to happen is, as opposed to a hundred people coming into courtroom and sitting right next to each other, we'll have about 20 or 30 and they'll be spaced out and you'll have your jury selection with some people and there may be people in another courtroom who can listen in, which wouldn't be the initial people you're questioning, but they can listen in and still be spaced out. So that process will be slower, um, but it can still happen. You know, the issues of people wearing masks and communicating with them and how do you read body language, these are all gonna be things that um, we're gonna have to struggle with. Um, at the same time, the solution is not to just, you know, throw away these hearings and have our, you know, clients languishing in, in, in carceral settings without any relief on the back end. So. Um, you know, this is something we're going to continue to be vigilant uh, about. We're going to set up a little working group to talk to people in other counties to figure out the best way uh, to do this. But is there something lost? Yes. But does that mean we shouldn't be doing these hearings? No. And I have a follow up on that, because at least when you get to jury trials, mm -hmm. you, you've got a Sixth Amendment uh, requirement that jury trials be public proceedings. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And you and I both know that of all the people in a courtroom, the only one who really matters who's looking at the back of the courtroom rather than looking forward in the courtroom is the judge. And mm -hmm. when the judge sees that no one has taken time uh, to disrupt his or her life, to come and sit and see what happens to your client, right? Mom, mom's not there or, you know, friends, whomever, that sends a particular message to the, you know, to the person who's watching the back of the courtroom. Mm -hmm. uh, the client, it's not a good message potentially. And I'm, I'm wondering with distancing and reducing occupancy, how do we, you know, how do we preserve the, the essence of the public trial here, including that public presence that can be essential for how our clients are perceived? Absolutely, um, great question. And, and I would say not only does it send, it, it sends an inaccurate message too, because we do know that there, and frankly, that's, that's, and that's something to keep in mind. Even prior to this, oftentimes, you know, a judge may see an individual and because of all the, you know, pressures of life and work and other kids, you know, family may not be able to be there as much as they want to. That doesn't mean they're not fully invested in the process. Right. I think it's so crucial because the reality is our, the reality of our clients is they are part of this broader family and community. And it's important that people with, with power know that. Um, in fact, we have a court watch program and there's Silicon Valley debug a program in the South Bay where they are conscious about getting the community into courtrooms so that they know that particular cases matter. And I think that's something we have to continue to do. Um, there's gonna be some challenges on that. And I think one thing we're gonna try and hope for is that we are able to preserve some section of the courtroom for family and community members to be there. And then we'll look into possibilities of people also zooming in whilst, you know, um, as another option and, and hopefully having the judge to your point, and that brings up the point, seeing that people are zooming in and, and knowing that, that, that those eyes are there and that that person is a vital member of a broader, broader family and community. I'm going to interject one quick question of my own, and then we're going to end with a very good question from Nick. Um, okay. Five or six minutes. Sure. Um, my quick question, I think, is what does defense investigation look like right now? I mean, so much of defense investigation really has been about shoe leather, mm -hmm. uh, or mm -hmm. knocking on doors. Um, you know, rooting through files and, and just tracking people down who may or may not be enthused to be tracked mm -hmm. down. What does that look like right now for your office? So I, I, I spoke with an investigator the other day who did a FaceTime interview and it was, you know, and there was, it was, it was a good interview that she conducted. So uh, that can happen at the same time. And I'm going to go to one of my heroes, uh, Brian Stevenson. He talks about you know, hopefulness, a willingness to be uncomfortable, um, changing the narrative and proximity. And I'll focus on proximity right now as a vital part of providing high level representation and potentially uh, changing some inequities in the system. And so much of, I think, wrong decisions in the system happen because we're not close enough, not close enough to the client, not close enough to the community, not close enough to the scene, not close enough to fully understand things. So it's still going to be a vital part of investigation and as a, in the defender community as a whole that we're out there. Now it's going to be uh, something that we're going to continue to have to develop what that means to be out there. Um, maybe it's setting up a meeting with someone where you just stay distance and still talk and maybe you talk to more people and maybe we're more efficient in how that happens. Maybe we are also doing a little bit more by phone and, um, and by FaceTime or Zoom. But at the same time, I think, again, coming back to my earlier point, it's really important that we see that as an and, not as an or, because that, that uh, what did you call it? Leather, leather, leather time or shoot time or- Leather. <laughs> that leather time, if you're wearing leather is, is is I think still vital to, to really high level representation, which is, and high level representation is what's needed to, to get closer to equitable outcomes. Well, as promised, Nick gets the last question. It's a okay. good one. Uh, what do you think about being an elected public defender and how does that affect the elective model? How does that affect 
your office and work? And is it a good model? You, you may or may not be biased. You've been both appointed and you'll have to stand for election, but I think it's a good question. I think in, I think it is a good model in a lot of places and certainly a good model here in San Francisco because I'm very, I try to be very transparent about what our office is about and what I think is, is important for uh, public defense, public defender clients in the community more general. And I'm able to go out and speak very transparently what, what I think is important. I think so many things that we try to deal with in 850 Bryant, uh, which is where the criminal courthouse is, in San Francisco for adults are issues that are really could be better dealt with in the schools by addressing inequities in the school system, by addressing environmental issues, by addressing employment opportunities, uh, by uh, addressing youth development opportunities. And to be an elected public defender, as an elected public defender, I can look at how we make those connections and ways that we can, um, you know, bring some of that synergy and a more broad outlook to, to some uh, social problems in our society. So I think uh, that's really vital. And secondly, um, so much of our perception of what's for too long been a criminal injustice system has been shaped by the prosecutor and all the narratives on TV and movies. And so there's so much misunderstanding of what we do in our clients. So for me to be elected gives me the opportunity to be in public spaces and really talk about uh, the vital role that we play in the system. No, Raju, San Francisco's remarkable public defender, thanks for joining us today very much. Thank you so much, Dean. It was really uh, a pleasure. And thank you to USF for making this opportunity available to all of us. Thank you so much to both of you. This was a really fascinating conversation. Um, thank you to everyone who attended. Just as a reminder, this has been recorded, so we'll be emailing this out for you to be able to watch again or share with others. But thank you again to um, Dean Strang and to Mano Raju. This has been a really great time. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone.